Well, I'm back once again, ladies and gents. Uh, kind of just life happened, was a little busy. That's why I didn't catch uh, movies over the past two weeks, even though there was a lot of stuff that came out that I wanted to. Uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to take a look at the Purge Anarchy, or no, Purge Election Year and The Shallows, both of which I wanted to watch. Just had a good, uh, didn't get a chance to get out. And I hear very mixed things about Ghostbusters. And I, if you watch, you've seen my history of uh, reviews out there. I actually surprisingly don't see a lot of comedies. I don't know why. Comedies are more of a, I don't know, for me, is more of a catch it on television thing for some. But I am not here for any of those films today because I did finally take myself out last night to see. Star Trek Beyond, the third edition of, I guess it's being referred to as, oh, okay, accidentally clicked the pause button. Yeah, the new Star Trek, which was, of course, started in 2009 with the Abrams film, a uh, J.J. Abrams film, Star Trek. He, of course, did the second one. Uh, part of his going over to do Star Wars uh, meant he only could do the, as a, only be attached to this one as a, uh, a producer, how much he really was involved, we don't know. But, uh, of course, they gave this to Justin Lin of the Fast and the Furious franchise, although he did not start that franchise. I know he's kind of taken it over somewhat, but uh, I forget the, na the guy's name, but he sh the, the actual director of the first film that actually shows up in it as like the pizza delivery guy. I remember that. Anyway, uh, this is Justin Lin taking over, so this is one that people were a little worried. Will How will this transition from uh, being a J.J. Abrams vehicle to now being you know a full franchise that's got to go under its own momentum? Of course, all the, uh, the main actors are still returning. And people were very concerned. One, because uh, Kirk was driving around in a... Uh, in a motorbike in the trailers, and of course it's from the guy that did Fast and the Furious, so people are like, really? I, I could buy, in context to the film, I could buy it. The The part that people are really going to they get on, and I haven't, I haven't been on the internet, I'm recording this after getting home from work, where it was actually a surprisingly busy day, so... I hadn't even had a chance to like take a look at any of the forums or Reddit or anything else that I normally would do. I kind of got home from seeing this last night, passed out. But I, I can guarantee you this is already becoming like a mem. If not, shame on the internet. Shame on you. This is kind of... Slight spoilers. The uh, galactic threat, the, the massive horde of drone ships... That is going to conquer the galaxy is defeat it through the power of music. I I am not kidding there. They, they the the crew of, of the Enterprise, although they're in a different ship at the time, use music to blow up an alien fleet, and it's Beastie Boys songs. Let that sink in if you haven't seen this. Yep. And now they, they, they come up with a techno babble excuse for it, but it's like, really? And of course they used the Beastie Boys song from, that they had in the, uh, in the 2009 Star Trek. <sighs> of course they're referring to it, oh, is this classical music? Trying to put my Scotty impression on there. Which, by the way, should mention him. Oh, well, actually, since we're talking about Justin Lin, and I was on Justin Lin, um, I think he did an okay job. I don't dislike this movie. Uh, I'll put that. I, I don't hate this, but I'm also not the biggest Star Trek fan, although Star Trek fans hate anything new, and then after it's like been 15 years old then all of a sudden they like it in classic and it's they they can't stop talking about how much great it is so give this like 15 years when they're, they're doing other star trek stuff and then all the star trek fans will be referring back to this series is like oh can you remember that amazing jj abrams reboot they did you know why can't the new stuff be that good you know what's gonna happen 
you're already starting to see some of that stuff with in Star Wars with the uh, pre- in the prequel trilogies. Although there there very little of that because there's very little you can do to salvage those films. All right, I digress. But yes, uh, I I was fine with the film overall. I enjoyed it. It was a nice little popcorn film. It kind of did feel like um, more of a Star Trek episode. I guess best best way to put it. it looked like it was like a bigger version of that, and that's kind of good because the the other films. I think one of the criticisms a lot of people had is. And, and they gave leeway to the first one because it had to reboot everything, that they felt too event-like and that this was some sort of long narrative or you know tight story, when in reality, you know, Star Trek should be kind of episodic and its movies should be kind of episodic. They could have character stuff that flows through those movies, but it shouldn't be like a planned single-story type deal. Which I, I don't think they really ever were pushing for that, but this certainly feels much more episodic. In fact, the, there's a, a line in the beginning of the film where, film where Kirk goes, "This is things are becoming episodic." Uh, speaking of Kirk, uh, Chris Pine, I'm finally kind of happy with him in the Kirk role here because part of the problem I think with the the previous two Star Trek films here is Chris Pine just looked too young to be in the captain's chair. Like, he looked too young to be a guy that would be in charge of this. He's now, I think he's like 35, 36. So he actually kind of looks like he'd be a person that would that could have some rank. You buy him. He looks, he, he, physic, he physically looks older. He's old, He's aged more than anyone else in the, on the cast. Which, kind of surprising. I mean, even Zachary Quinto looks a little bit older. Carl Urban looks exactly like... Carl Urban. But Chris Pine more so than everyone else, and that's to his that's to the benefit of the role. He's he's got the with that age with when you when you look a little older it's easier to project authority. Uh, it's really hard to do that as uh, when you when you're younger. Uh, one of the problems that they you know, that's one of the problems why a lot of female action roles don't actually seem to work is because they always cast a a like 18 year old that's supposed to be the super spy and you inherently in the back of your mind go but to have all these skills you must have trained and acquired and learned all this stuff for years so the person should be much older but Hollywood never casts like somebody in their 30s although Rogue One I um, what's her face in Rogue One is is in her 30s, so you you buy the experience a little bit more. Uh, but I, I again, that's a little, that's a little digression, but it, less so with males for whatever reason. But they really do that with the females. Uh, occasionally, the playing against that works, so but that's not an issue with this film. So. Where was I? Ah, uh, yes, I was going through kind of the cast. Uh, I, I was speaking to casting actors, but we I guess we have a transition point here with Simon Pegg, who I said I was going to get to. Now, because Simon Pegg wrote this script, yeah, but along with another guy called, uh, what was his, his name was like, oh yeah, it was a, uh, Doug Jung. No, no, I, I'm not making up a name there. No, his name is Doug Jung. I believe it's pronounced Jung. Uh... And you can kind of tell in the movie just because of all like how c- kind of convenient stuff happens to Scotty. Oh, and of course it's written as they find a new hot alien babe on planet. So of course, who who finds who's discovered by the alien babe and who hangs out with her the entire time? It's of course Scotty. Ooh. You even kind of can tell. I think he purposely wrote that most of his stuff would be like his scenes would be on a you know air conditioned set while the rest of the crew is out in I don't know where they film some of the outdoor scenes probably in some uh, quarry out in the middle of the desert he wrote most of his scenes to where he would obviously be on an air conditioned set close to wherever he lives <laughs> uh, 
but he does a, he does a serviceable job. Speaking of new a hot alien babe, the newest addition to the crew, and they do heavily hint at the end of the movie that she's like joining Starfleet and she's going to go and be trained, is uh, Sophia Botelli's Jayla. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Jala. Normally, Scotty just calls her Lassie throughout the entire film. So I really, after seeing it, I, I thought her name actually was Lassie. Uh, for those of you that don't recall, uh, don't re recognize the name, and you probably won't recognize her in this film, it's because they do a decent job with the makeup and enough to... She doesn't have, like, really obvious... Um, I don't know what you would call that. Uh, facial, facial additions, but she does have, like, these little slight ridges put into her head, enough to where it actually changes her a, a face so that I couldn't recognize her. But she, uh, Sofia Botella, is the girl with the uh, the bladed feet in uh, Kingsman, The Secret Service. So she's kind of, I guess, becoming a Hollywood staple at this point, because she's also due to show up in the uh, Tom Cruise Mummy movie. As the mummy, apparently. Uh, I liked her. I liked her performance. She I, she fit in well with everyone. And unfortunately, I think with the passing of uh, Anton Yelchin, uh, who really, out of all Hollywood deaths, he has the most, like, real, kind of like... Wow, that's like a normal accident that could happen to literally every, anyone. Like, normally you're expecting some sort of... Cra when somebody dies in Hollywood, if they're, if, especially if they're at a young age, you're expecting it to be like suicide, drugs... Or some insane, crazy accident. Uh, you know, something sort of like with Paul Walker. But this one was more of a... It was his, his car just happened to roll down the roll down his driveway while he was getting his mail and crushed him. It's literally something that could happen to, like, any normal person. Anyway, but I, I think with this passing, they've... They have already announced that they're not going to replace uh, the checkoff role. They 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 haven't figured out how they're going to address it, but that they 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 won't have a new checkoff in the rest of the uh, as the series progresses. So I would not be surprised if they decided to fill the the checkoff role with uh, this J uh, Jayla character since she's already been introduced. Uh, she's in there with that with. Uh, with Yelchin, so th there could be a torch passing uh, a bit there. And uh, speaking of addressing uh, the passing, now obviously the Anton Yelchin's death occurred after the film was essentially already in the can. So they, were, they weren't able to do much to for that. However, of course, Spock... Uh, the original Spock, Leonard Nimoy, did pass in the, I guess, in the writing stages of this film, and so they really did incorporate that. They have a moment, you know, they actually say, yes, Ambassador Spock, Spock, Ambassador Spock has died. It, they even tried to play, like, a joke with it, like, oh, Jim, I'm dead. Which I think in years to come, people will kind of, like, they should have had that joke in there. You know, after it's, like, not too soon anymore. <laughs> but they, they have a nice little moment where they send... They, they have a... Uh, Zachary Quinto kind of... Ref looking at... Uh, find, get it, receiving some of, like, uh, Spock's belongings. Other Spock's belongings. And, you know, seeing... He's got a picture of the original crew. And they try to make it as a, some, some uh, an element there. Um, Idris Elba is also in this. He does a okay job. He's like it's kind of typical villain syndrome where he, they they have a great actor. He's under a lot of makeup for most of the film. I'm not going to spoil that part. Uh, and he's got they give him of course a very kind of weird speaking pattern, so he's not like soliloquizing or anything. Like I think Eric Bana probably had more of an acting opportunity in his role in 2009 as the villain. Uh, But it's Idris Elba, so he's no he's he's good in this. He's it's fine. Uh, it's just not like something you'd go and write home out. Again, he's like buried under a lot of makeup. I'm mean, still impressed with the makeup job. They they certainly are doing. It seems like there was a little bit more practical effects on this one. 
And I think that's kind of a general thing. I think finally uh, the studio execs have realized that, unfortunately, studio executives, and the Sony leaks kind of prove this. If you've ever actually gone in and read those, uh, especially when you look at the, not only read them, but like read from when they were you know, written, like the top executives at Hollywood are surprisingly like unaware of how like have people like are complaining. Like, people have been complaining for years and years that they would rather have practical over special or uh, over CGI. And you read those same those emails that were leaked from the Sony executives, and they were going, "No, no, we need CGI. If it doesn't have CGI, it's crap. No, don't do practical effects. CGI, not for any financial reason, mind you." Not that CGI is is cheaper; it's actually normally more expensive. But they literally, for for uh, throughout the two thousands, thought that audiences preferred CGI over practical. So they were spending more money on effects that everyone thought looked like shit. I'm not going to completely, you know, trash CGI. It's needed sometimes. But I am kind of glad. I think even if I'd have to go back and compare... Abrams also is very good. He's very much a, a practical effects guy. Uh, he does. He uses CGI, but he, in generally, in, in the stuff he does, he's normally pretty good with trying to get as much stuff on film as possible. Ooh. I'm getting a little hungry here. Unfortunately, my food is cooking. Uh... Oh, and of course, yeah, Carl Urban, excellent as McCoy again. I, like, I'm not going to get into the plot. Uh, the film, this this one's definitely, it, the characters kind of, how should I put this, finding themselves, uh, getting used to them, they are now the Star Trek crew. And they're doing their thing. You know, it's not being a... This film isn't a, a setup to a bigger one, thank God. And it's not presented as this is their final mission, this is the ultimate mission, this is them as the crew. There's no building up to them anymore. This, they are now them. And I'm kind of, you know, to be honest, I'm kind of really glad that for some of this stuff they've just gotten to that point with some of these franchises. There was too much in a lot of franchises of somebody becoming a character rather than them just being the character everyone wants them to, you know, want it. You know, that's kind of... The Marvel uh, the Marvel films at this point, it, you know, they've, they've gotten past introducing superheroes to the world. They have a superhero world now. They can, they're having fun with it. It is what they've everyone's wanted. If that makes sense. I don't think there's much more. I mean, I think I give you my impression. I did enjoy the film. Uh, the action's good. There is, of course, the ending where they literally, they yeah, they try to make the techno babble excuse. Oh, we need a frequency and oh, oh, radio and we can what we need to broadcast this sort of waves. Ah, to disrupt the enemy fleet, we'll we can blast them with music over radio, which to me sounds like it would. It's not some sort of other lower level frequency. Something that would be a little more difficult to, you know, have this happen. I don't know. So, of course, they blast music. They blast Beastie Boys and blow up an entire fleet. That is going to be the hardest. That is the, the biggest drag on this film. I mean, overall, uh, I don't know how I'd rate this one. It, it might be three. It might be two. Yeah, and not a not as a score, but as compared to the other new Star Trek films, which I should be also upfront about that. I'm not the biggest Star Trek fan. I mean, back in high school, I would catch the original series. Was it even high school? Or was it maybe even, maybe high school and intermediate school? Back when the Sci-Fi Channel in the afternoon didn't know what else to put on, so they would put like random older science fiction television series on. Uh, Star Trek, the original series, they would put on. So I've, and yeah, you know, coming home, I'll just pop that on while I was like doing my uh, my homework. So I've probably wound up, I probably seen all the original Star Trek episodes, but it's not like I was like finding them, going out to watching them. I was just, it it was happened to be on at the right time, when nothing else was. 
and kind of even, and I've probably even seen less of uh, Next Generation in my 20s. I like uh, would catch catch it every now and then, and when somebody had it on a syndication run, and I would sit and watch it. I've seen a good deal, and of course, growing up in the 90s, and. I was on when that was still new, and it was a newer syndication. So I've caught episodes throughout, you know, my life here and there. It's always been around, but I'm not. I don't consider myself a real like hardcore Trekkie, or even a Trekkie. Period. Uh, I do enjoy the films. I enjoy the series. I enjoy the older films. Some of them, uh, others are not so much. But <laughs> when it comes to the new ones, starting the, the new Trek, starting with 2009. Uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, and this one, Star Trek Beyond, I would say almost all three are extremely close to one another. Uh, I probably enjoy Star Trek 2009 more than the other two, but they're all really clumped close to one another, to where it's kind of hard to, to, for me at least, to say which one's better than the other. So I, I hope that helps you in determining whether you we're going to see the film, although, really, let's be honest, folks, and I've said this numerous times, any more people kind of watch reviews after they've seen the movie to see if other people have thought of the same ideals as they have, or if maybe, I think some people watch these reviews to see if maybe somebody articulates something they're feeling about a film else, or they completely disagree with me and are call me a douchebag in the comments. Actually, I haven't. I really, actually, there's normally I get like one random comment, and I that I get pop up on my phone. Hey, you have a comment on YouTube. Oh, when I get home, I'm totally gonna respond to that comment and can thank them for. And then I totally forget by the time I get home. So apologies if you were one of those people. Oh well. Uh, signing off for now, folks. Uh, please like, subscribe, share if you want. And all that fun stuff. Bye-bye.